What's going on, everyone? You guys doing all right? <laughs> okay, not bad. Midweek energy. That's okay. We are in week two. Everyone all of a two? We are in week two of our new series, Young and Restless. And here's what the series is about. Ready? I'm going to wrap it up for you. This is just what the whole thing's about. This is what we're trying to communicate to you through the series. We are suggesting to you in this series that as Christians, as Christ followers, Jesus is calling each and every single one of you to lead, to bring about good, godly change, and to be an example to others, even as a young person. All right, so I'm going to say that again. We believe and we know that Jesus is calling each and every one of you to lead, to bring about good, godly change, and to set an example for others, even as young people. And we want this series to be an encouragement to you in that. And we've got a theme verse for the series. We went through it last week. We're going to see it a bunch this week. Let's throw it up on the board. we got 1 Timothy 4.12. And this is our theme verse that we're going to be working through. And it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are what? Young. But set an example for the believers, like for other believers, even grown believers, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And so this verse is specifically calling you as a young person to lead out like that. And don't let people look down on you. And we're going to see that a lot in our story. So I told you first week, we're going to go through a couple passages in the Bible that really expound and demonstrate this. We're going to look at some different examples of young people stepping up to lead in the Bible. And last week we talked about King Josiah. It was a story that not everyone knows or is familiar with, but it's a significant, important story. And we learned from Josiah that he came from a long line of kings that did a lot of bad stuff. And what Josiah did is he undid all the bad stuff that all of his forefathers and the kings before him did. And so what we talked about, and applying this to your lives, as we said that you are called, as a, even as a young person, to break the idols and destructive cycles that have run in maybe your family for years, that has run in your generation, that maybe is, is part of just how you've been raised and in your household. you got to break those patterns and those cycles. Even as a young person, you lead in that. It's easy as a young person to just go along with all the, the things your family has done for years and maybe some of the, some of the sinful patterns that you've uh, been raised in. But we said last week, no, you stop that. Like, you can, you can be the one to stop that and lead out and change. So that was last week. That was the first week of the series. This week we're going to talk about a different biblical character. A biblical character you're probably familiar with. King David. Show of hands. Who's ever heard of King David in the Bible? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, that's good. And we're going to specifically talk about King David and a very, very, very popular story known as the story of David and Goliath. Who here has heard of the story of David and Goliath? Show of hands. Right now, there might be this temptation to go, whoa, 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 Matt. <laughs> That's cute and all, but I've already heard the story. I'm already familiar. Hold up. Here's what I want to do today. I want to maybe tell the story in a little different way. I want to shed some, some light on the story in a way that maybe you haven't seen it before. I want some things to, to kind of stand out to you. That maybe you were unaware of when you first heard the story. And, and, and here's what I endeavored to do this week. When I was studying, I didn't just open to 1 Samuel 17, which is where we're going to be, by the way. I didn't just open to that passage and go, okay, here's the story. No. This is good for your personal Bible study, too. I read what led up to that story. And that impacts how you read the story. Because instead of reading this, like, small, isolated story, I was able to see, oh, there's more going on here. A bigger story. So that's kind of how we're going to look at it tonight. And again, we're going to land in 1 Samuel 17. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there. Um, you've probably heard me say it three or four times now. When we're going to get into a biblical passage, I feel like I need to set it up for you. I don't like to just parachute drop you in the middle of the uh, Bible. I like to let you know where, we're at, we, where we are in the story. That's hard to say. So I'm going to go through the same quick two-second review I took you through last week, just so you know where we are in the biblical story. We're in the Old Testament, and I told you that there was this group of people named the Israelites. And God called them and chose them to be his chosen people. He brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And he brought them to this place called Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he gave them the law. And he gave them an identity. And he told people, hey, he told his people, use this law to show all the other nations what I'm like. And use this law to bless all other peoples of the earth. 
This is what I'm going to need you to do, Israel. And so Israel got the law, got the assignment, had this purpose, and they were going to head to the promised land. And all this happens in the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible. And so they're heading towards the promised land. Things are kind of going well. Things are kind of going well. Things are kind of going well. Then they get to the edge of the promised land, and they're going to go in, but then all of a sudden, now check this out. This will be relevant for the story today. They see giants in the land. They get to the edge of the promised land, and they're like, ah, giant, whisk, 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 giants. And so they have fear and trembling, and they turn tail and run. And they get out of there. They don't want to go into the promised land. And because they didn't trust God, because they didn't have confidence in God, they have to end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Until the second generation of this people group, the young people, like we're talking about in the series, rise up and they're like, we're not afraid. We have confidence in God and what he's done. So they get to the edge of the promised land and they're like, uh we're all set. And so they step out in faith and confidence in God. That will also factor into the story today. So first generation, scared of giants. Second generation, young people, more bold. And they're like, no, we got this. We're going to step out in confidence in God. We got this. They get into the land, and they're doing really well. They conquer the people. They go through this cycle where they're ruled by the judges. And then the people start clamoring for a king. The people want a king. They want a king, just like all the other nations. And so their leader at the time was this prophet named Samuel. And Samuel comes before the people of Israel, these people that came out of slavery in Egypt and got the law and went through the wilderness and are now in the promised land. He comes before them and he's like, hey, spoke to God. God told me who our guy is. We've got a king. You guys want to meet him? Cool. And so then he introduces them to this guy named Saul. So I have someone who's going to play Saul. Saul, come on out. Guys, give it up for Saul. Give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up. Hey. All right, here's the deal. Here's the deal you need to know about Saul. Saul, why don't you come over here? Why don't you stand right here, Saul? All right, the first thing it says in the Bible, the first description it gives for Saul is this. It says Saul was head and shoulders taller than everybody else in Israel. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the nation of Israel. Okay? You have to remember that for the story today. It plays into the story. So here's an easy way to remember it. Saul is tall. Say, Saul is tall. Turn to your neighbor. Say, Saul is tall. All right. Keep that in mind. So then he introduces the people. Hey, here's going to be your king. Then, like a couple days later, some time passes, and there's this coronation ceremony where they're going to make him the king. And you think Saul would be excited about this. You think Saul would be suited up for this Sunday's finest. You think Saul's like, all right, now I'm going to be king. Here's what Saul does. He runs and hides. Just go hide over there or something. He runs and hides. And so Samuel's like, I present to you your king. Your, he's a, um, is, he, is he with you guys? Did he say, where is he at? And he goes looking for him. He can't find him. Saul, Saul, Saul. So finally, they're like, all right, Saul, get, get your butt out of here, Saul. Get your butt out of here. And finally, Saul comes out. Now, why was he hiding? Uh, he's scared. He was scared of the moment. He was like, I don't know if I can be king. Uh, he was kind of intimidated. So th why am I telling you this? This is character development. This is establishing his character. Saul is tall. You need to know that. But also, Saul tends to kind of run and hide and not face up to stuff. He tends to kind of be cowardly and fearful, and he runs and hides. But eventually, Saul is appointed king. Things are going pretty well. He, d he has a short reign that goes well, but then he steps on some mud. And two Different times, he disobeys God in a way that God told him not to. God, God said, do this, didn't do it. Then God said, don't do this, he did it. So he messes up. And because of that, the prophet Samuel is like, bro, God is rejecting you as king. You had one job to do. You just screwed it up. So, all right. Yeah, that's okay. Well, you, you are bad. Okay. So, <laughs> and so he gets rejected as king. But then here's what happens. So here, come over here, Saul. So Saul... Knows he's rejected as king, but he doesn't know that there's another king that's going to be waiting in the wings. And that's where our other character, David, comes in. And so Samuel asked the Lord, hey, Lord, who is this king? You're going to raise up another king, but who is it going to be? And he leads him to this guy named Jesse who has all these sons. And his youngest son's name is David. So let's bring out David. David, come on out here. Come on out. Let's give it up for David. Woo! Hey, all right. <laughs> here, over here, David. Come over here, David. All right, so here's what you need to know about David. David is the youngest child in his family. This means he's the, in, in biblical times, not today. This means he's the least important and the most looked down upon. He's the youngest child. And he's just a shepherd boy. This isn't a position that commanded respect. 
He wasn't making a lot of money. He was just kind of a nobody back then. But God says, this is my guy. And so Samuel anoints him as king. He says, all right, you're going to be the king. Problem, how many kings do we have now? Two. We have two kings. This is kind of weird. And this is a story kind of about two kings. Now, again, Saul doesn't know about David. But David does know that Saul is king. But he doesn't know that David has been anointed king. So David actually establishes a rapport and a relationship with Saul. Saul goes through some depression, so many depression. Okay, so there's some frustration. Okay, that's good. That's not bad. Okay. He's going through some bouts of depression. He's not really feeling good. He's in a bad place. So he needs David to play some music for him. And so David kind of, he's a really good harp player. He plays some music for Saul. He gives counsel to Saul. So they kind of get a friendship and a rapport. However, David continues to go visit Saul, and then he'll go back home and tend to his sheep. He'll go visit Saul, and then go back home to his sheep. And this is kind of their relationship. And this is where our story picks up today. This is all that's happened. Saul rejected his king. David's the king waiting in the wings. Saul doesn't know about that. Saul still very much likes being king. But here's the problem in our story today. Saul is being invaded by a people group named the Philistines. Everyone, everyone say Philistines. The Philistines. And the Philistines are coming to take over the land of Israel. They're a foreign invader. Now, the situation, though, this is a precarious one. It's a dangerous one. The Philistine army, they post up on this giant hill, this mountain, over what's called the va Valley of Elah. And in the Valley of Elah, is just, it's, it has a low elevation, and it's between these two mountains, okay? So you have the Israelite army. You have Saul and the Israelite army. They're on w one mountain looking down on this valley. And then the Philistine army is on this other mountain looking down on this valley. Now, again, this is maybe something in the story you haven't heard before, but this is significant to the story. Neither side is going to be able to attack the other side. Neither side can move. They're at a gridlock. And here's why. Back in these days, and in the military strategy of these days, you always wanted the high ground. You always wanted to be in a higher position than the person attacking you. So even right now, like Beans, if I was like, try to get on stage. I would be at an advantage, first of all, because I'm super strong, obviously. And then second of all, because you have to literally fight uphill. So I could, like, kick you and throw stuff at you and, like, big face you away and push you down. And you'd have a harder time getting on stage, right, because I have the high ground. Well, neither military wants to attack each other because they're going to have to attack uphill. What's more, let's just pretend and say the Israelites are like, all right, guys, we're just going to go for it. Charge! And they run at the Philistines. The Philistines are going to laugh and be like, <laughs> Okay, and then they're just going to throw rocks and spears, and they're going to send guys to the base of the mountain and just start, like, knocking fools out, and Israel's not going to have a chance. What's more, if the Philistines decide, hey, we'll charge too, ah, then the Israelites are going to do the same thing to them, and basically this whole valley is just going to fill up with bodies, and it's going to be gross. And no one's really, it's just going to be a huge loss of life. So neither army wants to budge. They're at a standstill. And so this is the tension that the story finds us in. But then there's a problem. There's an additional problem with the Philistines. The Philistines, maybe you didn't know this about the story, had not only a strategic position, but they had advanced technology, and they had the biggest, baddest, meanest warrior in all the land. And his name was Goliath. Everyone say Goliath. That's right. And so we're going to bring out Goliath. I didn't have anyone that was tall enough to be Goliath, so I had to actually recruit two people. Oh, you're doing it this way. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go. Goliath. All right, here, over here. <laughs> this, my man is strong. My man is strong. All right, we're going to fly through some things you need to know about Goliath. Now, the measure, if you're reading your Bible, these measurements I'm going to give you aren't there. They use terms like cubit and shekel and things like that. There's a way to convert those, so when I'm giving you, like, pounds and ounces and stuff, know that that's just a, that's a conversion rate from the biblical text. They believe that Goliath is, pr is probably about nine feet tall. Let me give you a frame of reference here. Shaquille O'Neal is, like, what, like, 7'2", something like that? Yeah, like, I mean, nine feet tall. This man was a, a giant. He was a monster. Now, some of you might hear this and be like, okay. Yeah, he's nine feet tall. That might seem unrealistic to you. Well, it's very interesting to know that there are historians, scientists, and medical professionals 
who attests to the fact that Goliath could in fact be nine foot tall. There's actually this medical condition called acromegaly. And uh, in this condition, you have this growth on what's called your pituitary gland, and it actually causes an overgrowth of uh, human growth hormone. And so dudes with this disorder grow, like, really fast, really tall, and usually they have health problems because of this. And there's all these other side effects. Like, they tend to be really slow and sluggish. They tend to have bad, bad eyesight. And this is very interesting in, in the research I did. They tend to have, like, uh, their, their face, facial structure is kind of off, and they tend to have a really protruding forehead, like a really big forehead, like a five head, right? Okay? Like a really big forehead. Interesting to know. And there's actually, I was, I was researching this this week, there's been cases of this in history. There's a guy in the 1940s that was like eight foot something tall who had this. So th this is not outside the realm of possibility. This is a thing that's happened. And again, it's very interesting to know one of the side effects is a big forehead. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so here's a further description. It says that Goliath, not only is he on a snappy tall, but he's got this armor on that weighs 125 pounds. Some of you in this room might weigh 125 pounds. I don't know. But his armor weighs 125 pounds. That dude's swole. He's yoked walking around with armor that weighs 125 pounds. Here's the third thing it says about him. It says he's got a giant spear. We have a sword in this case. But he's got a giant spear that weighs 15 pounds, and it's made of iron. Now, you might think, like, okay, it's made of iron. whoop de doo What does that even mean? Well, here's the deal. This was a technological advancement back in the day. Because this is in the Bronze Age. And so Israel, their weapons were made of bronze, which is kind of inferior. The Philistines, because they were, they were coming from a foreign land, they had iron. And so iron was going to trump bronze in a fight. Let me give you an example in case you're like, what, is it? what are you even talking about? Okay, say you went to a fight with an aluminum bat. And the person you were fighting had just a skinny wooden bat. You would have a technological advantage over this person with the wooden bat. Does that make sense? You got, yeah, good. Okay. So they, the Israelites, didn't want to mess with the Philistines. They were working with the greatest warrior in the land. They had superior positioning to, in case they wanted to attack, and they had iron. So basically Israel was like, huh, we don't stand a chance. What's more is Goliath starts trash talking. And Goliath says, hey, 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 I got, I got, I got a proposition for you guys. How about this? Uh, you send out your best warrior, okay? And uh, we'll send out our best warrior, <laughs> which is me. And then we're going to wall out. We're going to fight. And then whoever loses, that people group has to serve and be enslaved to the other people group. Deal? You got a deal? Now, to us, this just seems like it's something that Goliath is coming up with. This is actually quite common in this day and age. And when, in this day and age, whenever two armies would oppose each other, whenever they were at a standstill like this, again, neither army wanted to move because, like, if we go down that hill, we're dead. Neither army wanted to move. Both were gridlocked. So what they would do to save on lives and save on resources is they would enter into what was called champion combat or single combat. And so the greatest warrior from one side would go fight the greatest warrior of another side. And whoever wins wins all the marbles, and, and the losing people group has to be conquered by the winning people group. And so this is actually, this is what Goliath is suggesting. And so he sits there, and he heckles the Israelites for 40 days. He just keeps at it. He keeps at it. He keeps at it. Send out your best guy. Send out your best guy. Send out your best guy. And <laughs> clearly, I'm our best guy. So here is what happens next. The Israelites have to respond. Now let me ask you this. Goliath is the tallest guy for the Philistines. It, would make, it wouldn't it make sense for the Israelites to send out their tallest guy. And let's see if you were paying attention earlier. Who's the tallest guy in Israel? That's right. Say Saul is tall. Turn to your neighbor and say Saul is tall. And so Saul, come over here, Saul. Saul should be the guy that's going to go fight him. Once more, Saul has actually a long military history of fighting the Philistines. So this is not his first rodeo. But uh, you know what our boy Saul does? It says that he and the rest of the Israelites become afraid and begin to tremble. And Saul hides in his throne room and won't come out and fight Goliath. 
Now, let's flashback, rewind. Remember when Saul was supposed to be appointed king and he was like, I don't know if I want to. And he went and hid? Yeah, same thing here. Character development, except that he doesn't really develop. It's the same thing. He runs and hides because he's scared. So this is the situation. This is the tension of the passage. So then David is out doing his shepherd thing. He's out doing his shepherd thing. And he's got three brothers serving in the military. And his dad's like, hey, go bring him some food. And he's like, okay, dad, let's go. And so he goes. He runs to the front lines. He assesses the situation. He's looking around, hearing all this stuff about Goliath. And he's like, who is this guy? I'm not, why are you guys afraid of this guy? This is ridiculous. So then, because David seems so confident, and we don't even know, like, why he's so confident yet, He's called to go before King Saul. And so we see that happen. So Saul, come back over here. David, you step back a little bit. I need you guys to face each other. So Saul, you stand here. David, you stand right here. All right, scoot it in, scoot it in. So they're going to have a little conversation. And Saul hears that David is brave and courageous. And he's like, this dude's not scared. He's not flinching. What's the deal with this guy? I should talk to him. So we approach. <laughs> you guys already know each other just in the story. But okay. If you haven't met in real life, that's good that you guys got to know each other. That's great. So here's what happens. David walks in, and this is what he tells Saul. He says, do not let anyone's heart fail. In the original language, it it's actually reads, do not let anyone's heart fall. Don't let anyone be sad or heartbroken about the situation. Because he says, I will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, two things. Quick review. Has anyone volunteered to fight Goliath yet? No, everyone's too squisky scared of the giants, just like their ancestors before them, who didn't want to go into the promised land. David's like, no, no, no I'm going to go do this. But here's what's crazy. In the original language where it says go and fight, there's this verb in Hebrew, lacham. And this is what's actually used, and it means devour. David literally says, I will go devour him. So not only is David like, I'll go find him and beat him. David's like, nah, I'm going to go eat this dude's lunch. I'm going to tear this dude apart. I'm going to kill this dude. Like David, I mean, he's, like, he's being bold. He's being courageous. So let's see how Saul responds to that. Let's see what Saul has to say to that. Saul speaks four words that are so insulting. You're so rude, Saul. He says, you are not able. Ouch. You are not able. What's his reason? What's his rationale? He says, for you are but a youth. Now we're going to see this word twice in this passage today. A youth, it's this, it's this word in Hebrew. I'm just going to teach it to you because it sounds cool. No, uh, it's not our. Everyone say not our. Not our. And so he says, you're just a not our. You're just a youth. You don't really matter. Now, hold up real quick. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. So for this series, Young and Restless, we're talking about stepping up and stepping out as young people and leading. And our verse is, throw it up there, 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Well, what's Saul doing? He's looking down on him because he's young. Rude. And so he's not even giving him a chance. So David doesn't flinch. He's like, it's okay, it's okay. And so David goes on to kind of give Saul his resume. And he's like, Saul, check this out. So, I know you think I can't, but he begins to tell Saul about all these things he did as a shepherd boy. And he's like, bro, back in the day, I used to be guarding my sheep, because that's what you did as a shepherd. And guess what? All these crazy animals would come at me. Lions would come at me. Bears would come at me. And you know what I did every single time? I struck them down. Lions would come at me, I'd strike them down. Bears would come at me, I'd strike them down. I'm not afraid. I got this. I can take on those guys. Then he tells a story. Now, this is going to seem random and irrelevant, but trust me, it's going to come back at the end of the story. He mentions to King Saul that every once in a while, if he would strike down a lion, he'd have to go pick up the lion by the beard and strike him down again to make sure he's dead. Well, we can probably assume that he did this because he probably had one time, he probably had one encounter where he thought the lion was dead, and he did what you do with anything you're not certain of. Like I did this as a kid. You poke it with a stick, right? Like we used to go to the lake and there was a fish in the water. We're like, is it alive? I don't know. Poke it with a stick, you know? Or like you see some kind of animal in the yard. You're like, we don't even know what this is. Dude, we better poke it with a stick, you know? But that probably happened sometime with David and the lion wasn't dead yet. And it probably like <laughs> got back up and he had to like strike it down. Make sure the lion's dead. So he probably learned a hard lesson and he learned from then on, if I strike the lion down, make sure I double back and make sure he's dead. Make sure the lion's dead. That might se seem random. It's coming back later. So he gives Saul his resume. 
And then he says this. And this shows where David's confidence lies. It's not really in his natural ability necessarily or he's like, man, I'm awesome. Here's what he says. He said, man, if the Lord protected me from the hand of the lion and the hand of the bear, surely he will protect me from the hand of this Philistine. And so he's got this confidence. And here's what I want to suggest to you. Because of his experiences and his gifts, he knows he's able to do this. And this is one of our takeaways for today. God will use your past experience and unique gifting for his glory. Okay, pay attention to that. God will use your past experiences and your unique gifting for his glory. Everything David had experienced with these lions and these bears was preparing him for what? For the challenge that he would face next. God was orchestrating everything in David's life to prepare him for this challenge that he would face. To prepare him what God, for what God was going to call him to do. So that when he got to that point, he could step out in confidence knowing that God had delivered him in the past. He's going to do it again. So, here's what happens next. Saul, so Saul, over here, you're facing him. Saul next is pretty convinced by this uh, show of courage. And so Saul goes, okay, okay, okay. You can go and may the Lord go with you. But hold up, hold up, hold up. I got an idea. I want you to wear my armor, okay. You need to wear my armor. Now, what, um, <clears throat> David's just like a boy, a shepherd boy. Saul is a big dude. He's a tall guy. Is Saul's armor going to fit David? Uh, No. And David lets him know. David says, he says, I can't go out like this, all right? Kind of like when your mom used to dress you as a kid, and you're like, Mom, I can't go out like this. No one wears, like, these pleated khakis anymore, right? That was me at Easter. I was always embarrassed. But he's like, I can't go out like this. In the original language, it actually reads, I can't walk in this. Like, David can't move. This stuff is, is too big, too cumbersome for him. He can't even move. And he says, I haven't even tested this out. And he's saying, like, Saul, like, I know you wear armor, but I've never even, like, done this before. Like, just let me do me. Like, I know how I've taken on lions and how I've taken on bears. Like, can I, just, can I just be me? And that's part of the problem here. Saul is trying to force David to be someone he's not. Saul is trying to force this expectation on David, like, well, everyone knows that you're going to go out and you have to fight with armor. And David's like, no, that's not me. And here's what's crazy. In, these, um, in this time, in this period of history, when you were in the military, you probably had one of three roles. One was cavalry, okay? You could be in the cavalry. And you'd probably be on a horse. You'd have some armor, not a ton, so you could move, and you'd have a sword. Two, you could be an infantryman. Now, this was usually for dudes that were really tall, really yoked, and they would wear really thick armor, and they would have, like, a spear or a sword or something like that, and they would do hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's like what Goliath was. That's like what Saul did. Remember, he was a big dude. Infantry. Well, then you had another category of people, and there's different words for them in different languages, but it means like a thrower. And so you, you'd have guys that would actually sit back in battle, and they would throw rocks, or they would throw spears, or sometimes they were quick, and they could run around, and they were shifty, and they could throw rocks and throw spears at people. And they couldn't wear big armor because it would weigh them down. So again, this is the historical context. Saul is asking for David to be an infantry guy like Saul is and like Goliath is. And David's like, no, that's not me. He can't operate like that. See, God uniquely gifted David with a skill set that he, that he perfected and honed as a shepherd boy. And so again, we see that God will use your past experience and your unique gifting for his glory. David is not Saul. Saul doesn't need to force David to be like him. God has uniquely gifted David and prepared him for the mo moment ahead and orchestrated everything in his life to lead him to the challenge he's going to have to face so he can step out in confidence in God, knowing that God has delivered him before and will do it again. So before we move on to the face-off, the final showdown, here's one thing we need to look at. I said this is a story of two kings. You've got Saul, who's super tall. Everyone say, Saul is tall. And then you got David. He's just a kid. And then you got Saul, who has this illustrious military career. He's got this, this background and all this experience in fighting Philistines. One could argue that his past experience and his unique gifting is preparing him to go fight Goliath. Because he's got a past there. 
One could also argue that David, he's got past experience and unique gifting that God has orchestrated and brought about to prepare him for battle. But which of these two is wanting to go out to battle? David. So what's the difference? Why David and why not Saul? Here's all the difference in the world. David is the only one in the passage that mentions God's name. David is the only person in the passage that ascribes any kind of belief in God or confidence in God. Saul doesn't, doesn't whisper a word of it. And we can see, we remember from Saul's character, and he kind of tends to run and hide. So this is what makes all the difference in the world. Yes, God's going to use David's past experience and unique gifting for his glory. And yes, God has, has orchestrated everything that, that, up to this point to prepare David. But also, David has confidence in God. And that's what's going to cause him, even as a young person, to step out in faith when no one else will. And that's what happens. So David, he comes to Goliath, and we, cue it guys, we have our final showdown, our final face-off. That's right. Oh, yeah. It's a match for the ages, ladies and gentlemen. David versus Goliath. And these two do. <laughs> Is that how people fought back then? You're not an Irish guy from the 20s, all right? Stop. <laughs> all right, so they did what any two great warriors do before a fight. Trash talk. And so the trash talk begins. And as David comes out, <laughs> people clapping. As David comes out, the text says that Goliath looks at David with disdain because he is a youth. We see this again. And that word there is this word na'ar. Everyone say na'ar. And that means he's a young person. He is a youth. And Goliath is looking down on him and despises him because he's young. He's like, oh. You're sending me this guy? Now, let's just check in real quick. This is the second time in the past is this junk has happened. And again, this is what our whole series is about. Our verse from 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Here's what's interesting. In some translations of the New Testament, it actually says don't let anyone despise you because you are young. That actually, that wording perfectly matches here what Goliath does. It says that he despises David because he was a youth. And so then... Goliath starts to trash talk, and he says, oh, man, I swear by all my gods that by the end of the day, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field are going to be chomping on your flesh, which is a little intense. But then David responds, and one of the things he says to Goliath, he one-ups him. He says, okay, cute. Well, by the end of the day, all your people are going to be laid out, and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field are going to be munching on their flesh. So he totally one-ups him. Oh, because Goliath's like, no, it's you. And he's like, no, all your people. And so the trash talk is going on. But then here's what happens. David switches gears a little bit. And David says, hey, he shows us where his confidence lies. He says, I, you come at me with a spear and a javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, and he will deliver you into my hand. Remember, flashback. He said, if the Lord deliver me from the hand of the lion and the hand of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now he's expressing further confidence in God, and he, and he says, he's going to deliver you into my hand. He goes on to talk about his confidence in God and how he's going to do this so that the whole world may know that the Lord is God. And then he ends with this line, and we have it on screen. He says, I'm going to win, for the battle belongs to the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell him, the battle belongs to the Lord. Say it like you mean it. And so he's got confidence in God, and he's ready to go. And so he runs at Goliath. And he starts pretending he got a sling. He starts swinging a sling around. He lets the rock that's in his sling go, and he tosses it at his forehead. Now, rewind. One of the things we've learned about this condition that Goliath had, this medical condition, is that you tend to be overgrown, and you tend to have a protruding forehead. Well, he's basically got like a billboard above his eyebrows, a can't-miss target, and so David throws the rock at that, Hits him right in the forehead, and he drops like a Beyonce album. Fast and unexpected, okay? Like real fast, real unexpected. And then, <laughs> nice, that was impressive. CrossFit Z. All right, and so Goliath is the, hey, uh, upper half of Goliath, come here. Upper half of Goliath. Oh, here, Z. Upper half of Goliath, come here real quick. 
just lay down here because we have to cut your head off, okay? <laughs> here, so, here, go ahead and lay down there. We won't actually cut your head off, okay? All right, so he's laid out. So here's what our boy David does next, all right? He runs up to Goliath, and we're not actually going to pantomime this. Takes his sword. You can't take a sword. You, you can go ahead and do that. But, but then he lifts his head up, and he cuts off his head, which is violent, I realize. But here's the thing. He struck down the giant, and then he went over to make sure that he was, in fact, dead by <laughs> striking him again. Rewind to the beginning of the story. Remember when David was saying, yeah, one time a lion came at me and had to strike him down and then had to go up to him and strike him down again? Because David learned a hard lesson when he was guarding his sheep that, hey, you got to make sure the lion's dead. Yeah, well, you got to make sure the lion's dead. And so this past experience informed this present predicament. This past experience he had was used by God along with his unique gifting for God's glory. And, and the battle was won. And again, God was preparing every part of David's life. He was orchestrating to lead David to this moment. And again, David didn't do this as an infantryman like Saul. He didn't do this in the way everyone else thought he would. He used his unique gifting. It says that he took down the giant. Now, I know he has a sword at the end. But it says that he prevailed over Goliath and he didn't use a sword. As in, like, he didn't use a sword to fight him. Because he didn't need one because that wasn't him. God had uniquely gifted David, and he didn't need a sword to, to drop Goliath. He just needed a slingshot. And so we see at the end here that in the story of David, God used David past experience and unique gifting for his glory. And he orchestrated every single thing, even from the time he had to kill the lion twice to make sure it was dead. He used everything in David's life to prepare him for that moment. And because of that, David had tremendous confidence in God's ability to deliver him. Let's give it up for everyone that was on stage tonight. You guys can uh, head out. <clears throat> so here's my encouragement to you guys in this, okay? Here's my encouragement to you guys. Here's, here's the, the good word you guys need to hear tonight. Every single experience you've ever had in your entire life, all the gifts that you've been given, all the things you've been taught, all the experiences you've had, the, the family you've grown up in, every single thing God has used and is using to prepare you for what he will call you to do. Every single thing. And yeah, that includes past failures, past heartbreaks past trials and struggles. And that includes all the things you're going through now. All the difficulties, all the frustrations. You're like, why is it this way now? This is ridiculous. Hold up. God is going to use that. God is going to use your past experiences and your unique gifting for his glory. You just got to be patient in the moment. And you have to realize God is orchestrating something. Just like a conductor, every little note, every instrument added, every experience you have, every decision you make, every skill you acquired, it's being used and will be used for God's glory. Similarly, before, <laughs> before any of your experiences, while you were still in the womb, it says in the Bible that God knit you together in your mother's womb. And God has uniquely gifted each and every single one of you. You, were, you just came out of the womb with certain proclivities and strengths and tendencies and gifts. And some of you are highly creative. And some of you are, are, are just freak athletes. And some of you are super smart. And then some of you are like really good listeners. And then some of you are really good talkers. And then some of you are really good at making decisions. And some of you are really good about thinking around and through decisions. And some of you are really comforting. And some of you are really confronting. And some of you really like to help people. And some of you like to really like push people forward. Yeah, you can do it. Each of you has been uniquely gifted. And as you go throughout life, you, you pick up more gifts, you learn more things. And again, God is going to use all of that for his glory. He is orchestrating all of this to prepare you for the task ahead of you, for the challenge ahead of you, for what you're going to face. And so this should give you confidence to step out, even as a young person, and lead even when no one else is. David, 
People are throwing shade at David because he's young. The king was throwing shade at David because he was young. Goliath is throwing shade at David because he's young. But David realized, like you guys should realize, past experiences, unique gifting, all being used, all preparing you for what God's going to call you to do. And so that should give you confidence. And so as you guys here begin to step out in faith, even as young people, here's what I would encourage you to do with this knowledge. I would encourage you to start leading in your families. Maybe you're the youngest sibling like David. And you feel, or maybe you're the middle sibling, you feel like, man, no one listens to me, I'm a middle child. Middle children in the room, praise hands, he gets it. Step out in confidence, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. Know that you are called to lead. Jesus calls you to lead, calls you to bring about change, calls you to set an example. So be the one in your family, even if no one else is a Christian, even if no one else is really faithfully following Jesus, you step out and lead when no one else will. Maybe in your school, Maybe it's a FCA and like there's not really a lot of student leadership or like people aren't really doing anything in your school uh, to help lead others to Jesus. And so maybe you're a freshman or you're a sophomore and you're like, well, I'll probably wait till like I have more influence on my senior year. Why? We saw in the story today, God calls you to be audacious. If no one else is doing anything, step up and do it. My experience when I was your age is um, I had played music my entire life. I've been playing guitar since like second grade. And I did, done, played a couple gigs and was in a couple bands. And our, um, our version of Sublime didn't have a band. And so they asked me as an eighth grader to lead the band. And when I first stepped up there, I think my voice was still changing. So I was like, oh, I don't know what I can do this, guys. But when I looked back, I was like, you know what? God's been preparing me since I was in second grade to step into this role. So I don't need to be nervous about it. I need to just step into this role. So maybe that's you at your school with FCA. Maybe you're in a ninth grade or a 10th grade and you're like, no, 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 I need to step up and lead. Maybe on your team, you're like, I'm not the best player, I'm an underclassman. No, that doesn't matter. You step out and lead in helping people find and follow Jesus and pointing people to the Lord. And even here at this church, we have so many areas that we need people to help serve. And here's the thing, people who are older in this church, it's tough because they're like, man, I've served for years, and sometimes there's a level of fatigue there. They're like, oh, man, I travel a lot to go see my grandkids, which God bless them for doing that. They should. And, and then you have adults maybe in their 30s and 40s that are like, man, I've got 373 kids, and um, they play 575 sports, and uh, I have to wait like uh, three days in traffic every day. <sighs> I barely have time to serve. It's exhausting. And so maybe as the second generation, as the next generation, as the young people, Maybe you guys should step up and help lead out. And at the end of service, we're going to have some directives for you guys, some action steps you can take to do that. Maybe it looks like becoming a shift leader on Sunday mornings for some of you, for you upperclassmen. Maybe it's serving in NMC Kids downstairs. And again, we'll give you some more cl clear instructions on that as we pray out here in a minute. So as you leave here, I just want you guys to be encouraged. I want you to remember the story of David and Goliath. And I want you to remember that God will, not might, not could, God will use all of your past experiences, the good, the bad, the heartache, the triumph, all of it. God is working all things together for the good. God is orchestrating everything. He's going to use your unique gifting, this beautiful, wonderful way he made you, all these incredible skills you have. He's going to use for his glory. So when you look at your life now and you look at your life back then, see the great orchestration. See the purpose and what God is weaving together, what God is preparing you to face. And may you, as you realize that, then have the confidence that God has delivered in the past. He's delivering you in the present. And he will deliver you in the future. So have confidence and step out in that confidence like David did. Knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we come humbly before you now. And we thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, and for your grace. Lord, we thank you that life is not a random sequence of events. It's not just chaos. 
Lord, every single thing is being redeemed in our lives. Every single thing is leading us to that thing you're going to have us confront, that thing you're going to have us face, that great work you are calling us to do. And so, Lord, I believe that you're going to do a tremendous work in the lives of these students. I believe that you have given them these past experiences, Lord. I believe that you have given them these unique gifts so that they can make a tremendous impact for your kingdom. So as Christ followers, may we step up and lead and bring about change and be the example. And I just pray a special blessing over these students, Lord. May they feel every time they step through these doors, may they feel not only loved by you, but loved by every single person here. Their group leaders, the band, the staff. And Lord, may they walk out these doors encouraged to be more confident in Jesus' followers in every context in which they find themselves. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I told you guys I was going to give you, before I released you guys, I was going to give you some next steps, okay? Because that's good. I don't want to tell you to go do something, and then you're just like, okay. And? So here's what we're going to do. We have um, some sign-up sheets. Sash, you put them by the back door, right? Oh, no, we put them in the classrooms. That's right. There is a sign-up sheet in every single group classroom, all right? And what you're going to do is you're going to have your, your discussion as usual in group. That's cool. Catch up on the week. Go through the discussion questions, all right? It's the first week of football. Maybe you got some stuff to talk about there. And uh, go through all that. And then I want you to look at the sign-up sheet, and it's going to give you some options of ways, if you feel led, that you can serve here at North Metro where there's some needs. Again, maybe upperclassmen, that's being a shift leader for our middle high ministry on Sunday morning. Maybe for some of you, it's serving in our kids' ministry, which, uh, spoiler alert, it's really stinking fun. So, as you go to group, just be aware of that. And, uh, again, you can just fill those out. We'll get those from your group leaders, and we can kind of give you next steps from there. So, you guys, have a great week. We're going to wrap the series up next week. And be watching social media, because the touchdown celebration dance is going to be dropping this week. So, uh, be watching for it. All right? You guys get out of here. Have a great week. Peace.